I know we use a form. Yeah, I have so many things I want to do, but I also just want to split this thing. You want to get paper out of it? So it's without attention. When do you finish? Um, yeah, you say, when do you compartmentalize? You never finish. I need to. Yeah, I was just actually tip, but you can go back to it. I'll just make sure it's and we have impact related from microscope around the brains. Okay, so the, the uh, next speaker is my older brother, who I owe a lot to before, <laughs> <laughs> including my interest in physics and many other things, uh, inspiring me. Um, so Dan will talk about ge geometry and latent signal representations of machine learning. Thanks, Dean. Um, my pleasure to be here, and I should preface my remarks by saying I don't know anything about nuclear physics. So, um, but what I wanted to, what Dean suggested I do is just give you a little bit of um, overview of some of the kinds of physics-related projects in machine learning that I think that you should know about um, that you might find interesting. So that's that's what I wanted to do with my time here. So I think in terms of kinds of the, some of the topics I wanted to try to impress upon you is. You know, really, I think there's a big question in AI about how to really understand these empirical successes of these large and deep neural networks. Um, one approach that I've been working on over the years, I've been thinking about, you know, what the representations that they use and in terms of their geometry of the representations. And so, um, you know, inspired by physics theory, you can think about how statistical um, methods can be used to try to understand these types of geometries. Um, and then also, too, in terms of now these generative models, the generative AI models coming out, you know, how that's related to geometry. I think these are all kind of questions that I think you as physicists um, could make some impact in. Um, okay, so I think uh, the main kind of lesson that we've learned, you know, from the last, say, 20 years of AI, machine learning and AI, is the power of scaling. And scaling in terms of, you know, um, your computers, um, you know, the data sets, and um, the ability to kind of scale that kind of learning process over time. And what you've seen is that, you know, in, the, in all these systems, bigger is better. So, you know, the, the graph on the left is just showing how, as you scale con convolutional neural networks to do some sort of image classification task, the bigger you go, the better you get performance. Um, on the right is now with large scale language models, you just see that again, bigger is better in terms of, you know, more data, more compute, more resources basically you're gonna have a better performance. Um, so now the question is, you know, where is this gonna go? And so my uh, friends in computer architecture are always talking about, you know, Moore's law, right? I mean, we've been writing Moore's law for 25 years on this curve. Um, so, you know, is there the end of Moore's law that's gonna limit this progress? Um, or, you know, the amount of data, right? Interscale, internet scale data. And I think actually the kind of limit to kind of where AI systems going is not Moore's law, but Malthus's law, right? <laughs> So for those of you who don't know, Malthus was an um, a economist, British economist, that predicted that, you know, this, the, the growth of human populations is exponential and, you know, and, and maybe with some crashes. And you can see that actually that that's held true for the last hundred years. The doubling time for human population in the world has been about 50 years, you know, 8 billion people today, 2 billion people 100 years ago. And that's been roughly exponential in the last hundred years. And however, it's been turning over. And if you think about that, that's the limit of data, right? In terms of human label data is how many people there are generating that data. And we're seeing a, basically the end of that compared to you know, what we're seeing with computers. And so you know, these large scale language models have basically been trained on everything on the internet now. So where's the next you know, round of you know, more training data gonna come from? And that's, that's gonna be, I think, a big limitation. So how do you get around that? So some people are talking, we'll use AI to generate data to train new AI systems, but obviously there's an issue with that. You all know about positive revert, you know, uh, uh, feedback systems. So you know, you'll get these kind of echo chamber effects. So what will be the solution to this? And this is, I think, critical, is how do we kind of make smarter algorithms that don't need this kind of exponentially scaled amounts of data? Okay. So I think one, yeah, question. Can I ask you, so... I, I have never thought about that. It's fantastic. Thank you for bringing it up. But I'm thinking in terms of you have an objective in mind when you're training these. So I can think there is an amount of data that will allow you to train these to a um, point where you're happy with. Even though the data is going to stop or the exponential growth data is going mm -hmm. to stop, is, are we at a point where we will actually need 10 times more data of this kind to be able to do some performance? I mean, that's what they're talking about is when you look at these plots, uh -huh. these are logarithmic plots. Uh -huh. Every year they're trying to go, you know, 
three times, four times, 10 times with the size of the networks, with the amount of training data, they're, 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 it's, it's, we're talking 10 so times. We lacking data. Well, what will happen is that we're basically used up all the data resources for, for these foundation models right now, right? So, mm -hmm. okay. So I think one thing that we want to be is a little bit smarter about how we build these models, right? How we build these systems. And I think, you know, as physicists, we're very used to trying to use human kinds of insight into constructing smarter kinds of uh, models. And one ex totally simple example is, is how we use symmetries. So, right, if we have some sort of periodic boundary condition, some circular symmetry, we know for a fact that the eigenvectors of a circular matrix are always Fourier mode. So what we can then do is, and this is the basis of signal processing, right, is that that's why we use Fourier modes to basically model the representations that we use in, in signal processing, right? So this is kind of, you know, one basic idea. Now, let's see, you know, where that takes us in terms of neural networks, all right? So this is actually, a, um, to relate to actually some current events, um, the Brain Prize, which is the kind of top prize in neuroscience, is being awarded this month to actually three physicists, former physicists, right? Um, Terry, Terry Sinowski is a, actually, he was an um, astrophysicist from Princeton. He, he actually was one of the um, co-inventors of the Boltzmann machine with Jeff Hinton, if you know that work. Um, he's, he's one of the people that does a lot of computational neuroscience. Larry Abbott was actually a particle physicist, um, now at Columbia University, he's done a lot of kind of brain modeling. And Heinz Ampelinski, a good friend of mine, is a condensed matter physicist that you'll see some of my work with him later, All right? So one of the things that's actually being highlighted by this prize is something called a ring attractor neural network, okay? And this is actually an interesting, one of the very simplest neural networks, recurrent neural networks that you can build. It's a, think about a system of neurons, Think about them lying on a circle. And what you do is you use the symmetry. And what you do is you actually design the weights of a neural network to basically have this kind of cosine modulation to it. And if you think about that, that's actually projecting um, the weights of a network onto a two-dimensional basis, which is basically the two lowest order Fourier modes, the cosine and sine wave. And that's what they're doing here with this model. And you put in a ReLU nonlinearity. So this is a nonlinear um, uh, uh, recurrent neural network. And what you can then do is study the properties of this. And what you see is that there is a circular symmetry to it. But what you actually get then is you actually get a, a broken symmetry in this network when the coupling constant, the A, uh, a weight is larger than a certain limit. And so what you actually do is you can actually show that the attractors of this neural network, that is if you start with any initial condition, you let the neural network uh, converge over time using the dynamics, it'll go to a, uh, a fixed attractor uh, a mode that's a broken symmetry, so it looks like a bump. So you think about these neurons in a ring, what you get is you get a set of activations that look like a bump, and, and basically they're all equivalent around the ring, right? So but, just to my ignorance, what does it mean to let it evolve? Does it mean train, or is it something? Just, just run this dynamics with a random- Just instrument. differential equation. Just okay. ODE, just run it, okay. and it'll basically converge. You're guaranteed to converge to one of these states. Okay. That's it. Thank you. Okay, and that's how this, neural network design. And so in terms of the activity space, so if I think about this n-dimensional kind of neural activity space, what you actually get then is because these modes are essentially on a ring, it's a one-dimensional manifold that's a nonlinear manifold in the space of activities, right? Because some are, this is sparse, right? Some of these are zero, some of these are on. As you move around the ring, around the, around the circle, you're gonna get this one-dimensional pattern of activity, right? And that's basically then you're generating a continuous nonlinear low-dimensional manifold from this very simple neural network structure, all right? Now, you might think that this was all just a theoretical exercise, but actually in the last few years, the experimentists have actually found such a network in your brain, okay? And this is actually something called the head direction system. And what you do is, right, imagine I keep my eyes closed. What's happening is that as I walk around, right, I can tell you that, suppose I know that this is north, and as I walk around, I'm getting vestibular inputs from my uh, ears, and I'm basically keeping track that this is now east. I can turn around, this is south, this is east, this is back to north, right? I can keep track of that in my brain, all right? And what they've actually discovered is by, uh, they, this is actually, they do these experiments where they take flies. They um, have them walking on these omnidirectional, basically a track ball in a virtual reality setup. They can measure optically the neural pattern in the brain of these fruit flies. 
And they actually discovered that there is actually a ring attractor neural network that's responsible for keeping track of the orientation of this fly over time. And it's basically using these modes and basically where the mode is at is basically the direction that the fly is actually pointing. And this was just discovered in the last few years, all right? So this is kind of, you know, one example of kind of intuition behind the symmetry, building a neural network. And actually you can find out that that actually is part of the brain, which is an amazing discovery. It actually has a topology of these neurons within the brain that actually has this ring structure that they found. Yep. They, they found this after the artificial version was created? Exactly. The theory came first. Yeah. Right. <laughs> so, so, so it's an amazing story. And I think this is one of the reasons why the brain prize was rewarded for this. Did they use optogenetics for this? Yeah. Or, okay. Yeah. So Carl's stuff and all yeah. the stuff is stuff that they used to the image. Yeah. And they can do optogenetics to like see perturb it. So they can kind of reinitialize the ring network into a new initial state and see how that converges. And they see this kind of these uh these goldstone nodes on the ring. Right. Okay, so that's that's something that if you hadn't heard about, you know, you should you should take a look because this is really exciting in terms of the impact that physics-based theories have made in uh, in neuroscience. All right. So the question is, how can we make this, you know, more general? So how do we go to larger and deeper networks? And so you know, this is kind of this head direction system, but you know, how do we understand these larger, bigger, bigger uh, neural networks? Okay. So in kind of engineering, the kind of conventional approach to trying to understand a deep network has been like a filter bank approach, right? So, you know, if you'd asked, um, you know, uh, electrical engineers 25 years ago, you know, describe how the brain works, they're gonna say, okay, well, the first set of neurons that you have would be something like say an edge detection system, you know, edge detectors. And then from there, you can maybe design more complex features that these edges combine so that you get things like, um, T junctions, maybe, and then you combine those with some more complicated features. So maybe you get curved edges, you know, meeting other curved edges. So they, that's the way that they were trying to describe the brain. And that approach actually has basically just failed, right? No, no one can kind of go in and say that these are complex features built upon complex features to try to do this mechanistic approach to understanding larger networks. All right. So the question is kind of how can we go beyond that, right? What are some of the analytic tools that we can use to understand deep networks? And so the things, uh, the type of idea that we've been working on, and this is again, an old idea, relatively old idea, is something called the manifold hypothesis. And the idea is that if I look at kind of the neural representation at the input layer of a network, it's gonna have some manifold structure to it. It might be very complicated convolutional, uh, convoluted types of structures, geometries, and then what happens is that as the signal progresses through the brain, so like in the visual cortex system, going from retina to lateral geniculate nucleus to you know primary visual cortex, V1, V2, V4, and, until you get the inferior temporal cortex is where people think that you do object recognition there in the brain. The idea then is that some of the geometry is kind of um, untangled, transformed in ways such that at the end of the day, you get much simpler geometries in this neural representation that you can then read out with, say, a very simple readout, like a linear readout. So, so you take a complete opposite, of course, you show before. The, yeah, so, complete opposite that they go from complex to. Yeah, so this is the idea that you know the, the world is giving you complicated signals, and your brain's job is basically to transform that into some sort of simple manifold where you can then read it out easily. Right? That's the hypothesis. And so that's the kind of working hypothesis. But now how, what do we mean by complicated structure? I mean, how do you measure geometry? What's the relevant kind of metrics to use to, to measure this? So that's the, that's the type of analysis that we've been thinking. Of, right? So these are a couple of papers if you want more, want to know more about this. Again, with Hein, uh, a couple other physicists, Young and Uri, who are mentioned on the papers. All right. All right. So, so just to give you an overview of kind of how this works, right? Again, if I think about inputs. Uh, I think Patrick mentioned that, you know, if you think about, say, an image as a big vector, plot that as a point. Now I have different types of images, you know, uh, of dogs versus cats. So I think about points being separated by some sort of decision boundary in this high dimensional space. Okay. So how do we, you know, think about theories of this? So this is now some historical review. So, you know, the simplest thing is a readout is a perceptron model in, in neural networks. Basically, you have your inputs multiply some weights. And now I have some nonlinear function of that. So ReLU, sigmoidal, this is all kind of uh, uh, versions of this. 
And so the geometry of this is really just a hyperplane that's high dimensional space, right? So I can think about the weight vector W as some uh, normal vector, this defines some hyperplane. And I'm really trying to think about separating points, you know, on one side of the plane from the other side of the plane. That's the geometry of it, right? So the question then is, under what conditions can you do this? There's a notion of linear separability. Can I find, if you give me some set of points that are positively examples, negative examples, can I find a hyperplane that actually separates these points? Sometimes you can do it, sometimes you can't do it, okay? Um, all right, so then question is, under what conditions can you do it, all right? And this is actually um, a famous result, you know, back from the 70s, Thomas Cover, who comes from information theory at Stanford. And he was able to find out the formula that says, if you give me P points in N dimensions, right? And now I can think about all possible binary labeling of these P points in N dimensions, right? So in this case, you know, with three points, I can label them, you know, uh, uh, positive example here, negative examples here. I can think about all the different labelings. So the total number of labelings is two to the P, right? Two, two labelings for each point. And the question is how many of these labelings, dichotomies are actually linearly separable? And that's what he calls CEP comma n, right? And what he found was that actually um, you can actually write down a formula for this number as a function of p and n. And this is the recursion relationship. What you do is you can you can basically relate you know the number of separable dichotomies with p plus one points, the number of dichotomies at p points in, in one lower dimension, because that's how you can classify this new point. You write down the recursion relationship, and this is the formula that's you know summation over combinations of k choose p minus, uh, p minus one objects and sum that up. And that's always less than two to p. Okay, that's the formula, right? Um, what does this mean? Well, if I plot the number of linear dichotomies, uh, the linear separable dichotomies over the total number of dichotomies, what this means is if you give me a set of p points in general position in n dimensions, and I give you a random binary labeling, can you find a hyperplane that separates them? Okay, that's a problem. And what you see is that, um, you know, if I have it in, so I'm sorry, this always is a font, it missed next step. But if I plot as a function of the dimensions, n equal to three, what you see is that as long as this is the ratio between p and n. So as long as the number of points p is less than n, then you can always, no matter what, separate the, separate the points. So that's called the VC dimension in, in machine learning, okay? But you see an interesting thing. So what happens is that the probability of being able to classify the points drops you know, like this. So in n equal to three dimension, it drops like this. n equal to 30, 30 dimensions, it drops like this. n equal to 300 goes like this. 3,000 goes like this. And in the higher dimensions you go, basically you get this kind of sharp cutoff where if the number of points is less than twice the dimensionality, you can always separate the points. If the number of points is larger than twice the dimension, you can never separate the points. This is like, this is basically a phase transition. Okay, and that's the key result, right? From Cobra's theory, all right? So this is not the whole story though, because we wanna, this is just whether you can separate them. But in machine learning, we also care about robustness. So one idea is even if you could separate the points, you know, what's the best way to separate the points? And this is a notion of margin, is that I wanna pick a separation where the, the distance between the, the closest points is as large as possible. That's called the maximum margin solution, okay? Mm -hmm. Because what that means is essentially think about, I have a, Train set, I separate them, and now I perturb the points. That is, I jitter the points. Then as, if they're far away from my separating plane, then I'm basically going to have robust solution. I won't be able to flip them in terms of the other side. So that's why the notion of margin is very important. All right. Okay, so how do we now characterize the set of solutions with a given margin? Right. I want to have a set of points, but random labels, and now I want to be able to classify them in a linear hyperplane with a certain margin. Okay, so the way you have to do this now is to go more statistical. Um, this is actually work by Elizabeth Gardner, who is a statistical physicist. And what you have to do then is classify how to characterize the volume of solutions with a particular margin. And the way you do this is you look at this in terms of weight vector space. You know, every point with a certain margin gives you a linear kind of um, a, a constraint. You write down then the volume of the weight vectors that can satisfy all these constraints with p points. You write this down. You want to compute this volume. Now, you actually don't want to compute the volume because it's not extensive quantity. You actually want to compute the log volume. 
over kind of random realizations. And so you do the replica trick, right? Where you basically look at, you know, replicas of the volume, you calculate this, and then this becomes in high dimensions as n goes to infinity, p and n going to infinity, p and n ratio being finite. Mm -hmm. You can calculate this exactly using the replica theory, okay? All right, so then you can actually make these predictions that as a function of margin, you know, how many, how many points can you classify in n dimensions? You know, at zero margin, it's two. This is what we saw before from the Cobra formula. But as you demand more and more um, uh, separation, you can actually predict which point, how many points will you actually be able to classify and which ones you can't. So this is, this is, you know, as long as you're in this regime, you can always classify them with a margin. Above this, you can't classify them. And you can also predict, you know, when they actually have um, which point, how many points are actually on the margin. That's called support vectors in machine learning, and how many points are interior, and so on. All right. So this is what you can do with this. All right. So now, what we wanted to do was extend this. So instead of points, we actually wanted to think about data as actually manifolds. So the idea is that if I take an input and add some continuous degree of freedom to it, like I can rotate the image, or I translate them, I scale them in certain ways. Instead of having a point in this vector space, I actually have you know, a whole kind of continuous set of symmetries to this point. And so really, instead of separating points, I need to think about separating manifolds. And that's kind of the, the extension that we wanted to do. Right? So the idea is that you give me a set of manifolds that can represent you know, different objects or different classes with these continuous symmetries to them. And so now the question is, you know, under what conditions can I actually separate out these manifolds from each other? Are the manifolds easy to separate? Are they hard to separate? Okay. So to do this, I won't go too much into the theory, but we have a you know a geometrical model of a manifold. Now I should be specific here that manifold does not mean something like a Riemannian manifold. It's just a basically kind of a, a set of points that has this kind of geometric structure. There's no there's no metric and things like that. So we have a description of a manifold. We write this down. And then you can think about the different limits. So if I scale the size of the manifold, right, as I go to a small, small manifolds and manifolds become points, I get recover then, I should recover the limit that I had before with the point theory. But if I go full, if I make them very large, I can think about these manifolds as being these low dimensional hyperplanes that live in this kind of higher dimensional embedding space. And the question then is under what conditions can I actually separate those? And then you can actually write down that you know, um, in this limit, you'll get a reduction, a huge reduction in the capacity by one over d, where d is a dimensionally of this of this manifold. What's the definition? So, what what separates this manifold from just set? Like, what what do you mean by geometric structure? Yeah. So we are actually writing down in uh, a d-dimensional basis. We have a, a basically a, a description of these points, essentially the set. And what it actually is the most important thing because it's linear separability is the convex hull. So it's basically a complex hole. But there's no differential structure, no nothing. Yeah, then we're not assuming. We're just basically saying, can we write down a, a linear hyperplane that where this will be on and so on? Okay. Yeah. Question? If two manifolds, they have some overlap, does it will have some problem? Yeah, so if two manifolds are on top of each other, then you'll see, then that's what essentially what happens when you go to a limit where the number of manifolds and dimensionally is so high, then you'll really have a problem. But before you even get there, you'll find that you can't separate them. Right. So, so then you can actually do this uh, replica calculation. You can actually write down a, a formula that describes, given this convex hull description, exactly how many manifolds you can actually, if they're randomly labeled, how many manifolds you can actually separate, you know, with a certain margin. So this is the theory. Um, and, and what you actually find out is then you can actually, um, these kind of the, the kind of uh, order parameters of this model are that there's something like an effective radius to the manifold. Right, which you can write down in terms of its geometry, and there's something like an effective dimensionality of this manifold, which is kind of you know the the kind of most significant degrees of freedom of the manifold. And then given this, you can write down this capacity. All right. So what this does is gives us insight into how to actually measure the geometry in terms of these order parameters that tell us under what conditions can you actually kind of separate manifolds from each other. And that's that's what the theory leads to. Okay. And you can also find out some interesting things. You get support manifolds, so that instead of having points on a manifold, you can actually have manifolds that are touching the support planes with a single point. That's kind of a, a zero-dimensional uh, support manifold, but you can also have things that are embedded in one dimension, two dimension, three dimensions, all the way up to fully embedded types of 
manifolds in the support plane. So you have a whole kind of um, a taxonomy of support manifolds instead of just the support vectors that we had in the point theory. Okay. Okay, so then you can actually use this in terms of analyzing a deep neural network. You can take a deep neural network and you think about what's happening is what happens to the manifold structures as you go through a network such that at some level, at some depth, you can read out, you know, that these are cats, these are dogs, these are, you know, um, t-shirts or shirts, whatever it is that you want to read out, right? So uh, at what point can you say that you actually have kind of compressed the geometry enough to be able to do this readout? So, okay, so that's, that's, and I won't go into those details, but that's something that those papers have followed up on. Taking this idea of how to measure the geometry, tracking that through a deep neural network, and then showing, um, you know, in these different types of neural network architectures, you know, how, how is it that you can actually uh, do the separation? Why can't you do it after five layers, but you can do it after 20 layers in a network? Um, you know, how robust is that separation, right, from, from the geometrical property? And then also to, to try to actually look at now people are using this to analyze brain data, neuro, actual neural data to see, you know, V1, this is V2, this is V4 in the brain, whether you can actually measure, measure these geometrical properties as well. So that's that's a whole field going on. Yep. At the very beginning, I mean, the dramatic interpretation of the plane was that I have a, I had as I had as an activation function, like a step function. So that either it's larger than that, it's one, it's smaller, it's not. So uh -huh. I have a plane. If I have more complicated and fuzzy yeah. activation functions, is that still a plane? I guess no. And then would this theorem still apply? You? Yeah, so it's 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 what happens typically in these kinds of networks, I think, um, is you typically have some soft what we call a soft max readout, which is basically something like a separating plane that says in this direction, if you're above this side, then you're gonna say that that's a t-shirt. Yeah, on this side, if you're above here, then you're saying that's a cat. That's how you do kind of more than two classes. So it is still kind of a plane that's getting, you know, it's, it's the, the geometry is still at the end of the day, at the last layer, is basically doing some sort of linear separate. Thing. Okay. But not of the, say, visible variables, maybe some latent variable. Yeah. So that's why you actually, um, you, you go through these, you go through these layers because you, you have some weird structures that you have to transform into things that actually can be read out with a, okay. with a simple linear readout at the end. Thank you. But all the, all the neural networks that you use essentially at the last layer is always a linear readout. Thank you. All right, so I think I'm running out of time, right? You're, you're, you're 30 minutes in. But, okay, but, uh, then two couple minutes. I know, I think uh, Morton's gonna talk about generative models, maybe. Yeah. Okay, so I just wanted to make a few comments of that. So these days, you know, there's a lot of excitement about generative AI in terms of generating images, generating uh, uh, language, these kinds of things. Um, one interesting area is diffusion models. And so what they do is they take samples, like image samples, these vectors, and they basically add iteratively Gaussian noise on top of these things. So they're basically generating at the end of the day, if you add enough kind of iteratively Gaussian noise, you're going to get something that looks like a sample of just pure IID Gaussian noise. And what they do is they train neural network models that can reverse this. So now you've generated this kind of um, sequence of noisier and noisier images, and you now basically train a neural network that can go backward on this process. So now you can start with you know, random Gaussian noise and then basically generate samples of an image, right? So from some natural image data sets. Is that kind of relatively unique? So yeah, so <laughs> not unique. So what happens is they start with a, gener a random noise, and then they basically have, and I'll show you, sometimes they, it's not unique. They actually have stochasticity in this product, but there's also a deterministic process that gives you basically something that looks like the original kind of a sample from the original probability distribution of images. This is something that could be used for cryptography? No, this is just done to make your pictures that you see here. You're right. You're right. You're right. You're right. Okay. Suppose that I give you just that blurry image, but yeah. I don't know the network to decode it. Yeah. Then, well, yeah, so the network here is highly trained to be able to do this. Right, right, but it's, I don't know it. Yeah. It's completely obscure to me, but then I only fed the network, I can read it. Since you're just adding Gaussian noise to it, to form the encryption, it's like the encrypted version itself, it would be hilariously easy to crack. Cryptography is a horrible thing. Yeah, so the question is, do you know all the process? Do you know these noise? I mean, this is like the old uh, Shannon you, type of ideas. So my my yeah. question was, yeah. don't these models work like you you have that noise and you can tell it what you want, but must be somehow taking all of those training images and be able to combine them. So is, is it so so yeah, what, what happens is that this is a sample from some say about 
probably distribution, it's probably distributed images. You take one sample, you noise it up like this, and then you basically then, you know, the, the reverse process then generates a sample from that distribution. You don't get exactly this image. You don't know which image you get unless you could have some context controlling it, which is now the new work, but the original model just, you just get a, 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 an image from that original probably distribution. Uh, any of them that was just trying. Exactly. Okay. That's it. Yeah. So, so what is the logic behind what are you trying to learn? Yeah. yeah. Okay, so let me tell you how you yeah. think this is what you should think about, right? So this is just a stochastic differential equation, right? So you basically start with something, you add some Gaussian noise to it, and now you'll have, you know, this is the process. So you're basically evolving stuff with a with Gaussian noise. Now think about this. This can be described by a Fokker Planck equation, which says that you started with some probability distribution. When you add noise to it, you're gonna basically it tells you exactly how the probability distribution evolves. All right. So what we do with reverse diffusion is think about what stochastic differential equation basically can reverse diffusion. Okay. And what you do then is you write down a, um, a dynamics here, this, this kind of bias term in your uh, uh, stochastic differential equation. If it's basically goes against, kind of goes up the gradient of the log of the probability distribution, that's basically smeared probability distribution. If you do that, then you can go back against diffusion. And you can prove that plugging this in will basically go backwards in time of the forward process, right? That's that's basically the whole physics field. So does, does it make sense to say that you're learning how to envision an image that makes sense? You basically start with a Gaussian distribution and you by, by running this dynamics, essentially in time, you're gonna get some kind of a, a prior distribution of say, uh, 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 of the set of the images. So if I just start my random sample, I run this dynamics, I get a sample from the original distribution. That's it, right? Questions? Shouldn't the, the diffusion things from poker plan type equations destroy information? Like something my brain is screaming entropy and uh, yeah, yeah. you shouldn't be able to run the clock backwards. So yeah, so what you do is you essentially you are you need to reverse this Laplacian term with okay. the random so, no but this, this does it. You basically go up the gradient of the of the log function. That's a score function. So you go up there, it's basically going against the kind of the natural diffusive dynamics and that's how you reverse it. It is basically and then this is what the neural networks learn. They learn how to calculate the score function and that's that's the vector field that you go and use in your in your reverse diffusion. Isn't eta a stochastic thing that is just random? So this is, the, the, so I'm trying to describe, this is the forward process typically, you have to, okay. Add, okay. which is the Gaussian noise that you're adding, and then this gives you this term. So what you have to do to because reverse it, you, you, have to okay. get, you have to generate a term here that cancels this term yes. and goes back. That's yes. it. Thank you. All right, I'm done. That's it, that's how it is. <laughs> okay, so anyway, I, I, so the question then is, you know, if I think about kind of my original distribution <laughs> as a manifold, Right on this manifold, and I do this generative uh, kind of process, and then I can think about these score functions as, as reversing this. And uh, this is a video that just shows you that you can actually then do this, right? You I, like this is a ring network. You know, this is, can you click that? <laughs> See if that works. Yeah, yeah. This is a ring network. Start with a Gaussian random distribution. You run this diff reverse diffusion process, and now it can basically have flows that go back onto the ring. Right with a certain with a certain modulation to it. So this is this is exactly showing you that what these neural networks are. All right. Okay. So that's that's all I wanted to say. And so yeah, hopefully you got a you know a little bit of a, a flavor of you know some of the ideas in physics that have made their way into machine learning and maybe for the future these are some things that you might want to think about in terms of your approach. All right. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Thank you, Dan. That was really interesting and informative. Are there more questions? Yeah, Jane. Yeah, just real quick. Uh, with the ring network, is there a spherical network that's already been worked out? I, mean, I feel like that could be very useful. Not sphere, but torus. Okay. They, so they basically do uh, kind of, you know, two-dimensional okay. and generate torus. Sphere is a little harder because it's hard to kind of uniformly sample the sphere. So that's always a problem. Pablo. Thank you, Daniel. As usual, it's fantastic to hear you. Super, super interesting. Uh, actually, I have I never understood how the diffusion models work because I never sat down to read it. So also, thank you for explaining that. <laughs> now I do. Um, my question is, um, this was useful to create images out of noise. Do you see an immediate application that we could use it for our problems to obtain? For, I'm thinking, can I obtain solutions to partial differential equations through this? Because if I could start with noise, uh -huh. apply something that maps me to a solution, it's not the solution that I wanted. It's going to be a solution, but if it's mapped to a solution, comma, 
the parameters that came with that solution. That is info that is information that is useful for us for like likelihood functions and things like that. Mm -hmm. Anybody trying that? So, I mean, right now, all the uses I've seen is that kind of you have some desired distribution and you're trying to generate a sample of that desired distribution. And sometimes you want to control that conditional, like maybe a conditional distribution based upon some context. So that's that's what these diffusion models have been currently used for. Now, if you wanted to try to try to use it and think about the process itself as a trajectory or I mean, these are still these are open questions right now. Right. I, I've seen. New work that says, okay, this you want to do diffusion, but not on this, but maybe on a graph. So now you want to generate a diffu uh, uh, some probability distribution on a huge graph, then you can do this kind of reverse diffusion to kind of generate that. So I've seen work, works like that come. In the simplest thing I, I could be thinking, can I solve the harmonic oscillator equation using any of these? Uh, because if, if you can think of a way yeah. that you could explain to me, then that's something that I can iterate all over to see uh, if I can import this more complex. Yeah. Nuclear physics. Well, if you say that the ground states of these of the harmonic oscillators under different parameters have some uh -huh. distribution uh -huh. to it, then you can imagine trying to do something that learns that distribution that's what I'm and thinking. generates it. I will know you from later. Gaussian noise. Yeah, you can yes, do something. That's what that's what I'm thinking. Okay, I will know you later. Okay. Thank you. Sebastian. Yeah, this is like along those lines. Like, there's lots of problems with noise, obviously that we have, right? But they're not Gaussian diffusion noise. So, is there any any hope to map some I'll yeah, problem with noise, say, say sign problem or whatever. Yeah, so I, I mean, maybe, a bunch of this formulation. Yeah, so if you start with something and say, tell me that there's a better noise model than Gaussian, and then you write down some equivalent to Parker Poinsot. So I mean, I mean, something sure. like lattice, like the Gein has like lattice simulations, you have noise, right? Mm -hmm. It's single to noise ratio, mm -hmm. but it's a different problem here. It's like a differential equation that mm -hmm. you add the noise and you actual data diffuse, yeah. but it's a very different problem. You have. Well, you can change this into a Markov chain. Yeah, that's it's okay. You can do a Markov chain and then you could then write down the equivalent of how. Okay, Sam. Um, so you were talking about this idea of you start with some more like complicated manifold, and as you proceed through layers, it gets simplified, and that relates very much to how, uh, like, I have the couplings in the work that I'm doing where I'm going from starting with some input and eventually getting some functional relationship as you move forward. Is there in in this handling, is there a point that they find where you have a certain number of layers where suddenly you're getting a representation that just like as you go deeper it doesn't get any simpler, like you've reached its simplest? Well, there's a, there, there's an idea of neural collapse, which is the idea that you know kind of you shrink everything down to points again, like these manifolds go to points. Yeah. Um, we don't see that really happening in deep networks. Okay. That was one hypothesis of how these people know that. Yeah. Network. Okay. Interesting. Okay. okay. Other questions. If not, let's thank Dan once again. So we're gonna connect you from HMI. You wanna put it yeah, I think that should work. So as Morton's getting ready, so um, after Morton's talk, we're gonna uh, we're supposed to take a picture during the coffee break, but I forgot. So we'll take a picture <laughs> right after Morton's uh, talk, and then we'll have the discussion. But so don't don't leave so that you're not in the picture. <laughs> All right, so we are very happy to have Borge, uh, George Jensen, who will talk about mathematics of discriminative and generative deep learning from deep neural networks to diffusion models. Okay, so thanks to everybody. And uh, I may probably, since there's a pretty uh, neural network savvy population here, I will most likely try to uh, diminish that part and then rather jump into the generative models. The um, uh, but before we start, I actually wanted to link up with uh, some of the discussions we had this morning, and the question to you guys here. So I just want to see where the audience is. So how many of you are familiar with uh, generative models, diffusion models, stable diffusion? Okay, so we have uh, two people, two three people. Okay, 
Now, one of the reasons why I bring this up, uh, that goes a little bit back to uh, the discussions we had this morning, because there's a lot of focus on these uh, models. And in particular, if you scroll down on this page here, uh, there's a short description of uh, uh, stable diffusion, what it is. It's actually a uh, kind of uh, uh, advancing the uh, diffusion models, which uh, Daniel discussed previously. I'm going to give you some more of the mathematics if we get time for that. So you can see actually how we can eventually program it if you want to. But you can see here that stable diffusion uh, is a one of these more popular models, which is used to uh, generate images and uh, also from text you write in a prompt and then you generate images. And it's actually one of the, uh, how to say, uh, really hot models on the market nowadays for generating images. And so the question is, uh, how can we actually use something which is so much inspired by physics? The original paper, which came in 2015, which in this field is uh, as close as you get to archaeological time, <laughs> uh, that paper was entitled uh, Diffusion Models from Nonlinear, no, Non Equilibrium Thermodynamics. So there's very much physics inspired uh, models. Uh, you will recognize, uh, as you saw from Daniel's talk, the Fokker Planck equation. Uh, you will hear about the Langevin sampling and many of these basic uh, concepts which you encounter in statistical mechanics and uh, transport theory and, and other subdisciplines of physics. So uh, take a look at some of these uh, uh, discussions of uh, diffusion models. And I think that uh, for us, and this goes a little bit back to the streamlined collaboration where we want to go, what kind of things could we start studying? And why is this interesting? I would try to motivate why it is interesting. And also how that can uh, actually uh, couple with uh, many of the initiatives which we see from the Department of Energy now. Where there's a lot of focus on large language models, uh, this type of models, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, any questions so far? So this is a kind of more overarching motivation. here. Now you can find uh, the material for all this uh, slides which I'm going to present today if you go to my GitHub address. So my username is MH Jensen. And uh, there is a course which I teach on advanced machine learning. And there you will find codes, anything you'd like to about some of these generative models. So feel free to just download everything and use it as you want. And uh, lecture notes, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. And you will find the material which I will present today if you go under the doc folder you will then find on the, there's actually an explicit folder here for Streamline. And then there's obviously the rest of the teaching material here. So you can actually fetch this and play around with it if you want to. And what I wanted to say uh, after these words here is uh, a little bit, so I'm gonna use this uh, Jupyter notebook, but I'm gonna be rather, I would say, I'm gonna rush through some of the slides. There's more material here. Than, I would, than what I will cover, okay? So it means that uh, I'm gonna jump more, I'm gonna go quickly through the uh, neural network part. So what I have here is, is a, uh, for the neural network part, is a kind of a baby stepping you through how you can write your own neural network code, if that is of interest. So there are many small pedagogical elements. So who here, how many of you have actually studied or used neural networks. Okay. So how many have never heard about the back propagation algorithm? Excellent. So that means that uh, I don't need to remind you of uh, what we might call as almost high school physics uh, of the application of the chain rule. But this is a, it's not meant as an algorithm, it's actually an application of the chain rule. And I guess everybody here is uh, most likely familiar with the uh, automatic differentiation. Yeah, okay. So that means that then you know probably that the back propagation algorithm for neural network is nothing but back propagation in reverse mode, where you start with the endpoint, because you often have less variable at the endpoint, and then you propagate backwards, and then you train all the weights and the bias of the neural network. So that means that I can actually go more quickly through some of the neural network stuff. Is that fine with everybody? But I wanted to say something about uh, generative methods. 
And uh, uh, when you look at all these huge collections, can, can you guys in the back see properly? Yes. Can you read? <clears throat> okay. So, you know, you have tons of methods and some of these methods are methods which you would call the trade deep learning revolution methods. Some of these methods have been there for more than a hundred years, like the principal component analysis. Uh, linear regression, as you may know, I mean, was invented back in the 1850s by Gauss and, and others. And uh, then it was also derived from a probabilistic point of view where you start with a Gaussian or normal distribution and then when you optimize that one, you can get the same equations which you get in linear regression. So uh, some of these methods have been there and you may ask, why do we call these machine learning methods? Uh, Dean here actually coined a very nice word for it. We would call them low level machine learning methods where you have uh, uh, explicit analytical expressions for the parameters you want to learn and optimize. And then by a basic matrix inversion, you can then obtain the optimal parameters which optimize a function uh, which you have uh, chosen to optimize, which could typically be the mean square error. Now, uh, so we have uh, uh, tons of methods, but I'm going more to focus on the generative methods. And of the generative ones, I wanted to say something about, uh, as also Daniel mentioned, about Boltzmann machines, because they actually are quite interesting. Uh, they lost a little of momentum when uh, people dived into convolutional neural networks and, and other methods. But then there's been a revival of these uh, Boltzmann machines. And I'm going to tell you how you can use them. And there are some interesting applications. Then uh, I'm going to say a little bit about variational encoders, because you can view these uh, diffusion models as stacked variational autoencoders. And I will try to show you how you can interpret that. And there are some mathematical tricks which you need to deal with in order to optimize a probability distribution. So when I say that, uh, this goes a little bit back to generative modeling. So if you think of generative modeling, there's a picture which I borrowed from a textbook. Actually, these slides contain uh, many links to textbooks where you can access from the GitHub address of the authors. You can actually address codes and run things yourself. But the basic philosophy with a generative model is something which I, as a physicist, think is much more interesting than a standard neural network or a discriminative method, because we generate a probability distribution. And you know that when we have a probability distribution, we can uh, make predictions, obviously, we can find correlations in the data set, but we can also discuss causality, and we can also discuss uncertainties. What do you mean by causality? Causality, what is the likelihood of A given B? So if you think of the uh, the conditional probability, which you have in Bayes' theorem, that's just an example. And you will also see that when you look at the mathematics of variational autoencoders, that is you playing around with Bayes' theorem. Nothing but that. So in a generative model, you will train against some type of images. And with the, that training process, you're going to generate new images. And that means that you obtain a probability distribution, which you then use to so you could think of you feeding in a Gaussian and then training a new Gaussian. This would be a simple example. So if you train uh, one of these models uh, with a Gaussian uh, data set as input, you should get back the same Gaussian. Obviously, it will not be exactly the same. There will be some small errors or noise, etc. But you have this capability of generating new images. If, if images are the things you're interested in. Doesn't need to be images only. And then, if you think of the uh, many of the standard machine learning methods, which you have encountered in many, many occasions, uh, they are normally they fall under the uh, the slot or the description of discriminative models. That means that if you're thinking of a classification problem, you could train here a neural network or convolutional neural network to recognize whether this is a fungal painting or not. So you put a label on the data. So this is a typically labeled data. And then you would label a fungog as a one and not a fungog as a zero. And then you train a network to then uh, discern when you feed in a new image, whether that is a fungog or not. And then that network has a kind of a score, which is the prediction which you make. Like uh, uh, the 
the uh, introduction which we had earlier today by Patrick and Danny, where they showed the uh, MNIST data, which is a classic data set, which is being used. So that's a little bit about the kind of overarching ideas. The um, uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna skip some of the text, but I wanted to give a list of some of the methods uh, which exist out there, and uh, what are their pros and cons. So uh, there are methods which deal uh, with an explicit probability distribution, and if you think back to uh, basic course in statistical mechanics, you know that one of the objects which we often cannot calculate when you have a huge dimensionality is the partition function itself, which is a normalization. So then you clearly see the problem immediately when you're going to deal with this uh, generative models, how do we deal with the normalization cost? And there are many ways of dealing with that, with their own pros and cons. And in many cases, they would see models which deal with an um, approximation to the dense probability density. So when it says density as a PDF form, it's a probability density distribution. Uh, Variational open holders are models which approximate that density. We have energy based models where Boltzmann machines are some of the classical models which have been used for many, many years. And we have the diffusion models. And then we have the auto regressive models, which are extremely popular in large language models. We have normalizing flow models and also general generative adversarial networks. And many of you have probably met. Uh, Many of these names have probably even studied them. So I'm going to mainly focus on uh, those which deal with uh, an approximate, approximative density. But in my lecture notes, you can find also about uh, generative adversarial networks if you're interested. So there are some good books. Uh, there is actually, and this is a, a former Michigan State student who went to uh, Wisconsin and was an assistant professor in statistics, but then started his own company. And this is uh, actually an excellent textbook. So if you wish to use uh, uh, or teach yourself about many of these methods, uh, this textbook has a, a top GitHub address with uh, Jupyter Notebooks and uh, PyTorch codes. So it's not TensorFlow. And uh, it runs typically out of the box. Everything, I've tried everything. And then you have other textbooks, which are pretty good. If you wish to read more about the uh, diffusion models and uh, and also the variational open folders, there are some quite some pedagogical papers. Uh, there's the original paper, I think this is the first one by Sol Dickstein et al. And you can see the name, the unsupervised learning using non equilibrium thermodynamics. And uh, there's also a set of very good papers on uh, variational open encoders by King and Dwelling, who actually people introduced these methods originally. Any questions so far? I actually have a list of uh, references which could be of interest for some of you. Uh, so I'm, I'm going to go quickly through some of these things. But when you do the uh, machine learning one, there are essentially three basic ingredients. And one is obviously the data set, which you have. And then you have a uh, model, which is a second lot, with some set of parameters, which you want to optimize. And this set of parameters, they can be uh, connected with a likelihood function or just a simple model. If you're just picking a polynomial, this f of alpha could just be, the alphas could be the, the um, polynomial degrees of freedom, the constants you have in front of every polynomial degree. And uh, then finally, you have a uh, cost function, which is the function you optimize in order to find these parameters. So that means that, and probably as all of you know, I hope you don't get offended if I repeat some of these obvious things, at the heart of everything, there is an optimization problem. And uh, as I used to say half jokingly, the optimization problem is actually the part, if you can make improvements here, you will get many, many new friends. <laughs> and uh, I'm not inferring that you don't have friends. <laughs> but these will be friends who cite you. And uh, Adam, which is one of these ways to deal with the calculation of the gradients and the gradient descent, where you replace your second derivative of the cost function, which leads to a matrix, which is now called the Hessian. You replace that with a constant and you train that with information about the gradients. This method, Adam, has since it was presented in 2014, 
more than 150,000 citations. That says everything. So these are the basic things. And in the slides here, you will find some uh, uh, simple, simple things. But I wanted to jump to the, if everybody's OK with that, me jumping some of the basics. Because from the talks this morning, I think I would uh, put all of you to sleep. And it would also be pretty boring. So let's uh, let's go quickly into the uh, uh, generative models, if it's okay with everybody. If you're not too familiar with how to set up a neural network, I mean the uh, there is a, enough details here, so you can actually start writing your own network, a neural network code. And you will find the simple examples if you just scroll down here. Uh, I also put up some references. Yeah, by the way, let before I do that, let me mention this paper by Pankai Meta which is an excellent paper. So every example in the paper has a Jupyter notebook, which follows the examples. So that means that you can download the Jupyter notebooks and reproduce everything which is in the paper. And uh, it gives actually a, a very good bird's eye view on the field. It's back, it dates back to 2019, but it is uh, very accurate and it's very model, modern and it's, uh, it's a uh, well-written paper. Highly recommend it if you want to teach yourself about many of the methods which are on the market. Uh, so I'm gonna scroll down, so I hope you don't get offended because many of you have, most of you have seen this. And the, uh, there are examples on how to uh, set up the simple uh, perceptual model. And then you add uh, hidden layers, uh, you add a number of nodes, etc. And this uh, is a set of lectures which is actually used to uh, motivate the introduction of automatic differentiation. So essentially, when you train a network, you have a set of parameters, which are the weights and the biases, and you will typically tr uh, train or obtain the equation for the gradients by using the chain rule for derivatives. And then when you have these uh, uh, weights and, and biases, as they're called the parameters you want to train, what you then have is a, together with the optimization problem, you essentially have different affine transformations. So essentially, these are matrix vector, matrix, matrix, multiplications. But let's uh, go down uh, the code examples, as you can see. Uh, and the, uh, there's a link to, uh, so I'm not going to go, I just wanted to put up a lot of material in case you want to look at it. And this is also something we could discuss uh, for, the, uh, for, the, uh, for the Streamline project, whether we want to develop a kind of code library for training, but also when we post codes which we develop and uh, have them as a kind of a deliverable of, from the project. So that's something to think of as well. Now, there is a, an example, if you're more interested in object-oriented coding, there's a full uh, feed-forward neural network which you can play around with for both classification and regression problems. And you will also find links to a CNN code and then a recurrent neural network code, etc. But let's uh, look at some of these things here, like these energy-based models. And Dean, you need to keep, uh, keep. Uh, how, much, how long should I go on here? I mean, uh, so if you can stop by five o'clock, that'll yeah, be good. But I wanted to have some discussions as well yeah. on whether these things are interesting for us or not. So, so if you can go another 20 minutes. Yeah, we can... not more than that. Yeah. So the, um, the aim, as I said, the aim of these methods is to train a probability distribution and here I actually will focus on these ones and I have not included any discussions of uh, these other methods. These are also very popular methods. But I think that these methods, the first three ones, may be of uh, great interest for us. And I will try to motivate one. So let's now just look at what a probability model is. And you're, I guess you're all familiar with the, the uh, basic setup of a probability distribution. And in this specific case, you have uh, the H stands for hidden uh, parameters or latent space, if you want to use that wording, which is often used in connection with autoencoders. And uh, you're setting up the probability distribution and you have some function here. Uh, there is a pointer here. Could we just get rid of No, I, I was thinking of uh, the one on the screen. Oh, oh, oh. Yeah, I think that's, that's, yeah, if you just, yeah, right. Yeah, okay. Perfect. Okay. Perfect. So you have, uh, uh, this is your probability distribution, and you're making a model for that. 
And you know that the quantity which you have to deal with, which is the, uh, the nasty one, is your partition function. And this uh, sums of all your variables, if this is a set of discrete variables. The x is your input. The way I've spelled it out here is meant to be the input domain. And h is a set of uh, what we normally call hidden variables. And then uh, what we want at the end is actually this probability. Theta is a set of parameters which are going to be trained. So we are going to optimize a probability distribution so that we find obviously not the least likely uh, distribution, but we want the most likely ones. So this is the maximum likelihood maximization problem. And uh, uh, the probability distribution, when you look at it, is now a sum, it contains now a sum over these hidden variables. And uh, this means that uh, uh, you could alternatively, so this is normally called the marginal probability, you could alternatively also define a marginal probability for the hidden variables. And these are quantities which you would need uh, when you're setting up, let's say, what's called a Boltzmann machine. So one of the advantages of a Boltzmann machines is that you have, depending on the type of Boltzmann machine you set up, you have analytical expressions for these probability distributions. And that makes it uh, much, much easier, e easier to implement. And this kind of models got a revival in the quantum mechanical simulations by a famous paper by Giuseppe Carleo and Troyer back in 2017, mm -hmm. where they applied easy, the uh, Boltzmann machines on a quantum mechanical easing model. That was one of the cases of, of Hamiltonians, which they applied the, the Boltzmann machine to. So uh, this uh, XIs and HIs could be specific state. It could be, let's say, the uh, set of spin configurators, which you should have. So one specific orientations of the spins could be an X, uh, or it could be some other type of variables. So I'm just gonna define this in terms of uh, uh, vectors here. So I'm just gonna change it into this notation here, just to make it more complex. So X could be a, a configurations of different spins, or it could be a set of positions in space. And you know that if you want to calculate this quantity here and you have a, a binary model, then uh, you would have, if you have M such, uh, uh, variables x and n variables h, this is the dimensionality of the problem. And if you think of the easy model, even with 100 spins, which is a very modest case for an easy model calculation, you would quickly have uh, numbers which would exceed your capability of calculating this function. So the calculation of the probability distribution is actually one of the big challenges <clears throat> because typically when we look at say a quantum mechanical problem, this object is a multi-dimensional function. If you have uh, an atomic neon, you know, you have 10 electrons. If you freeze out the atomic nucleus, you have 10 electrons in three dimensions. So you have a 30 dimensional probability distribution. And to even to sample from that one is actually very complicated. So you see all the kind of problems. The equations look nice, but you quickly end up in uh, problems with uh, growing dimensionalities. <coughs> So the optimization part now is uh, you, again, assuming that uh, these different uh, variables are independent and identically distributed, which means that your probability distribution is the product of all these. And then you can uh, optimize this probability by optimizing the parameters theta, which will be the parameters of network or the model you have made, and then optimize it so that you obviously maximize the likelihood. Nobody is interested in the minimal likelihood. We want the maximum likelihood. So, but then we know that this problem is a little bit trickier and it's uh, easier to solve the equivalent problem where we take the log of that probability. And that's a standard, one of the standard recipes which is being used. So you would take the log of this function here. So if you write it, so this is the optimization problem, but you would rather optimize the log of this probability distribution. So if you look at that equation, if you pause a little bit, this is the central starting point, uh, whether you're dealing with the uh, diffusion models or variational autoencoders. This is the kind of function you want to optimize. 
And that means that you need to take the uh, derivative of this function here. That's what you want. And since we know that we don't want to calculate the partition function, you may ask, I mean, this looks nice, but where we do, do we go from here? Because the partition function is a multidimensional beast, and it's very unlikely that you will be able to calculate. I have a very really naive question about yeah. the normalization and partition. Yeah. And normally, we can calculate ratios of probabilities, right? And then normalize. If you do metropolis sampling. Yeah. Yeah. But, but you don't want any of that. No, metropolis sampling here would be very slow. <clears throat> so what is normally done is actually you do deep sampling, which means that you need to calculate the conditional probability. And then you sample again and again, while you keep all the other variables fixed, and then you just get one of the variables. And you redo this again and again. Now, one of the problems which these methods suffer from are actually long correlation times. And that can actually be less beneficial if you want to do also deep sleep. But the way this is normally done is something which is called contrastive divergence. And I wanted to give you the basic equations because uh, manipulations of these equations give you the equations for a variational open program. And these diffusion models are essentially just stack uh, variational order encoders with some restrictions. So if you now look at this expression, uh, the expression you want to calculate or you want to optimize is actually this expression. here. Now, in this case, this quantity is your model, this f. It's normally an exponential of some function. So that means it simplifies. So if you look at the standard Boltzmann machine, this really simplifies. But then we have this uh, thing here, which is less trivial to calculate. In this case, we sample from the data set, which we feed in. So that's an important thing just to keep in mind. But if you look at the derivative of the partition function, there are some tricks which you can use. Uh, and we can rewrite this derivative as an expectation value. And you would sample the points according to your model, which you have here. And you will simply use a Markov chain Monte Carlo machinery to sample this expectation value. Mm -hmm. So Boltzmann machines and all these methods, they rely on you being able to set up a standard Markov chain Monte Carlo machine. So if you look at this quantity, the um, what you have, if you look at the expression for the derivative, if you go back in your textbooks in statistical mechanics, uh, you will remember this expression here. Uh, you will also see some of these expressions being called the free energy in the literature. So there's a lot of physics inspired uh, uh, nomenclature and, and, and naming. But this quantity which you have here now, when you rewrite it, is nothing but what you have here. So you have the derivative, and then you can rewrite that one uh, in terms of uh, this equation here. And when you take the final expression, what you end up with is nothing but this. And this function here is assumed to be zero or larger than zero. So if you think of a Boltzmann distribution, you have e to the minus something, and that is a function which is always larger, gives you a probability which is always larger than zero. Yeah? yeah my question was, like, how restrictive is that? Is it not a problem in practice? No, no, it's not a problem in practice. Yeah. It is not. So the, um, because I mean, all the probabilities you deal with, that function f are positive functions. Right. I don't know how you would use a negative probability. Okay, so the um, in this case here, you can actually, when you look at this equation here, you have z and the function f, which is nothing but your probability distribution. Then you have the log, the derivative log of this function, which you have as a model. So you know this function. And that means that this is nothing but an expectation. And when you collect it, uh, when you collect all these terms, this is what you end up with. So if you want to deal with a Boltzmann machine in its traditional form, this is the equation you need in the optimization. So the first one is evaluated by the points in your data set, whereas the second point, you see this X uh, generated from a probability P, which is your model. So you will simply sample. So the second term is you performing a Monte Carlo sampling of the points you generate with the model which you have for the probability. So in a certain sense, you can think of the, this function here as 
function which generates some kind of fake data for you. And uh, this fights against uh, the function which is generated with the real data. It's just, just a kind of pictorial way of looking at it. Now, why is this interesting? Now, if you look at the, uh, the standard way this has been done, is that this function is typically given in terms of uh, a model. And then you would have parameters. So you would have the visible nodes, which are your input data, uh, multiplied with some bias. Uh, you have the hidden layer, or the latent space, as I like to call it. And then you have the coupling here. So this is the model for what's normally called a restricted Boltzmann machine. And these are a little bit easier to train than a fully stacked Boltzmann machine with connections between the nodes in each layer as well. And this has been the kind of standard and perhaps the most popular way of doing that. And in this case, this leads actually, when you do the calculations of the conditional probabilities, it gives you a sigmoid. So this is a typical binary binary model. When you calculate these uh, conditional probabilities for H and for X, you actually get a sigmoid function. And uh, that's one of the benefits of these type of models that you can actually produce analytical expressions for the probability distributions you need in the training. So a typical model then, if you rewrite this one, this is how your probability distribution looks like. And then you train this probability uh, distribution to reproduce the data by calculating these two quantities. So that's your training process. Now, the interesting thing here, uh, well, or perhaps the, uh, the weakness of these models is that you um, are in a way locked to the form of this function and your data may not follow that function. But what has happened lately is there's been a revival of these models where people have replaced this function here with say a convolutional neural network. And this is where if we look back at the, the talk by Danny and, uh, and Patrick, one could think of perhaps replacing this model which you have here, which is a so-called binary binary model with a PMM as an example. And then train a probability distribution. I think this could also be very interesting as a first approach to, let's say, training potential energy surfaces. So which you could train on a huge set of data, and then you could use the probability distribution you have to make predictions on what the potential energy surface could look like for that specific interest. So I'm just thinking more about what could be possible paths for us if we want to look at generative models. Mm -hmm. So the, um, uh, if you take this uh, model here, because uh, since you're training these gradients, there is a gradient descent. Yeah. There is an optimization part, obviously. And the optimization part deals with you uh, calculating the derivatives with respect to these parameters. And when you take this distribution, this function here, actually you have nice analytical expressions which are very simple to encode. So a traditional Boltzmann machine is actually not that difficult to encode. And when Kaleo brought it back to quantum mechanical studies, this, uh, uh, I would say, initiated actually a huge new field. And you will hear more about that tomorrow from uh, Jane and Alessandra here, about uh, you replacing a trial wave function in a Monte Carlo calculation with a neural network. So even if a neural network falls within the box of discriminative methods, uh, when you generate a, a wave function from a neural network, you're actually dealing with a neural network as a generative model in the sense that it generates a probability distribution. The wave function squared is a probability distribution. So in the, for the Boltzmann machines, what Carle and company did was to say that your wave function squared is this function here. That has its obvious limitations, as you can quickly see here. Now, I wanted to say, I mean, I think time is running out here. You have tons of these. There's a code as well. But then you can uh, have a simple binary binary if you want to try it. And this is just reproducing the MNIST data, which we saw earlier today. So this is what the uh, Boltzmann machine is doing and reproducing a set of uh, selected numbers. 
you can take a look at the problem. It's a simple binary binary model if you want to play around with things. And the uh, big thing now lately was actually a paper which has escaped my attention because it came around COVID when COVID kicked in. And as we know, COVID is a kind of black hole period. I don't remember anything what happened in these two years almost. And this is actually a very interesting paper where they actually use the philosophy of the Boltzmann machines to uh, but replace these models with a convolution model or a standard default model. And this is actually very interesting. Uh, yeah, any questions? So I I want to I don't think I will reach into the fusion models, but you can look up the uh, the uh, derivations. But I wanted to quickly to say something about variational autoencoders and how you can move from a Boltzmann machine to a variational autoencoder. And this is you uh, playing around with the same basic equation which you want to optimize, but then inserting Bayes theorem and producing a probability which uh, encodes your original data, but you produce a conditional probability, which then defines a latent space, which is normally much smaller than your input space, your X's. Then through Bayes theorem, you can train likelihood functions and cryos. And from these, you can feed them into a decoder part, which is the part which then produces a new conditional probability, and you use that one to define the final probability. So that's the decoder and encoder part of a variational encoder. So this is different from a Boltzmann machine where you actually take the probability distribution and you have this, uh, what we normally call a contrastive divergence, the one that, which I put up here, the function, the function you use in the optimization is that one. So what I'm going to do now, if I, first thing is that if you look at this quantity here, this is called, and you've probably seen this before, it's called the kullback leibler divergence. It's an asymmetric function in the two probabilities. And we know that this is zero when you have a, a, a model for your probability, which is this Q, which is identical to the probability which you are targeting. So if your data follows a Gaussian and you train a model for Q, which becomes a Gaussian, then the kullback leibler divergence is exactly equal to zero. And you see also that this is, if you have this probability, is nothing but an expectation value. It's an expectation value of log of P of X over Q of X. So this is one of the quantities which is used in order to rewrite this contrastive divergence and set up a training scheme for finding the probability distributions. Okay. So this is where we start. Uh, I've skipped this tetas just for the notational economy. So tetas are parameters. So this function we want, this is what we want. This is a probability distribution which describes our data without us knowing beforehand what it looks like. And uh, we know that this is just given by the in integral over the uh, latent space or the hidden variables. And then we can use the standard chain rule for probabilities, yeah. which we know we can rewrite like that in terms of a conditional probability, H given X. The nice thing with the Boltzmann machines, the simpler format for them, simpler form like a binary binary is that you have analytical expressions for all these probabilities. And then what, what is done is actually to introduce an encoder function, which is normally parameterized as a Gaussian. And that Gaussian, uh, so this is actually a uh, new function which depends on a new set of parameters. It's a conditional probability which brings you from the input data to a latent space. And you use that one to define the latent space. And within the latent space, you define a prior in terms of this variable H. So again, uh, what you would do is actually to start here. This is the quantity you want to optimize, right? As before. And then this is nothing but the log P of X and where we simply have multiplied by one here because this is normalized, right? So this is just a trick by which you can rewrite these integrals and you can rewrite it like this. And this is nothing, the quantity you see here is nothing but the probability 
of log P of X with respect to this model which you make. So this Q is a probability distribution you make. The normal this is either binomial or a Gaussian, which means also that this encoder part has analytical expressions. That's one of the advantages. And then you can uh, uh, just squeeze down a little bit. You can uh, you can rewrite this. Uh, you can follow the tricks here. And then uh, uh, when you rewrite it like this, you take the log, and then you get an expectation value for this specific quantity, an expectation value for this one, which is nothing but this cool but lively divergence, which is a quantity which is always positive or larger than zero which means that this quantity, which you see here, is larger equal to zero, because the KL divergence is always larger equal to zero. So this is the quantity. You can actually rewrite this once, and you, when you dissect the equations, you can rewrite this one in terms of a term, which is called the reconstruction term, and then you have what's called the prior matching term. So I'm going a little bit quickly through this, but it's uh, you implementing or using Bayes theorem and rewriting these integrals. So now uh, what you need in the optimization is to calculate these expectation values. And that is different from this contrastive divergence which you have in the previous case. The, adva the uh, advantage here is that you do have a model for this Q. So you're mapping yourself from the input data to a smaller space. You have a conditional probability whose equation you know your distribution you know, you will find a prior probability, which you then use in this reconstruction. So this is a prior. And then you have a final uh, optimization problem here. Uh, I'm not going through all the tricks which are uh, done here, but you can, uh, 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 there are several small tricks which, uh, which I have here and how you actually set up these uh, probability distributions and so on. So I think I should stop here, but if you scroll down, you will see that uh, you can define something. Uh, there's a discussion of diffusion models and where you can then set up chains of these uh, variational autoencoders. And that means that uh, when you use the uh, uh, standard rules you have for a Markov chain, where you can simply multiply the probability for the transition at that given time with that for the next time and so on and so on, that means that these uh, probabilities which you have here, they can then be rewritten in terms of a chain of these probabilities. So the kind of figure is that you are stacked variational autoencoders, you move from your input data, and then you move into a new latent space, and then a new latent space, a new latent space. And this uh, corresponds to a kind of denoising as uh, Daniel showed us. So your figure starts with a full figure, and then it denoised and it just looks a noisy figure. And then you reconstruct it. And then there's again the applications of Bayes' theorem. And then you reconstruct and at the end, what you want is this probability here, which then gives you the final probability P of X. So that's the basic step. So when you do a diffusion model, you put in some restrictions. And in a uh, variational open product, the latent space is normally assumed to be much, much smaller. And that follows the philosophy of autoencoders. Uh, if you think of dimensionality reduction, the latent space is normally much smaller than the space you have uh, for your input data. And then you use this latent space to define a new function you train to reconstruct an output. And this is the same philosophy when you use a variational autoencoder. So here you have some restrictions and that the latent dimension is the same as the data dimension. And the structure of the latent encoded each time step is not long. It is predefined by a set of Gaussians. And your Gaussian stays fixed. The only thing that changes is the mean value and the variance. And these are changed perturbatively from one step to the next. So you keep the same distribution. And the only thing you change are the parameters of the Gaussian. And this is extremely if fast uh, implement because you have just Gaussian, you have analytical expressions, and you change perturbatively the parameters of the Gaussian. So these are parameters which you then learn, or you can keep them as fixed hyperparameters, but you will normally learn them. And then you go back and you will train a uh, probability distribution here by stepping back again. And at the end, when you go back to X0, 
this is where you find your final property. So these are the basic philosophy. And I think if we think, I mean, also as physicists, there's a lot of uh, interesting stuff for this specific project, but also for the kind of uh, uh, things we want to study. And I think having a probability distribution is to me the interesting thing because I can use that to generate new data. And I know the errors. Okay, this was a, uh, a quick, quick crush course into these three of these popular generative models. Mm -hmm. And uh, feel free to use the materials you want. There are many, many references to uh, to articles if you want to dive and dig a little bit deeper. There are man links to many textbooks. So feel free to use the materials you want. Eh? All right, thank you. Well, it was a very informative talk. There must be some questions. You can see, yeah. Okay. Well, it's also the applications. So, so if you think of diffusion, having a probability distribution, you can actually train, as I said, a potential energy surface so you for fission. If we need a few uh, properly calculated yep. surfaces, yep. you will train the the, the model that give the process of that surface, and then you have the problem of saying which one you go. No. Yeah. Yeah, but that's. That's where you come in as a physicist, and then you have to decide which are the most relevant ones. Yeah, Pablo. Uh, two, two comments more then. Well, a lot of information. Yeah, but I thank know. Thank you, because I now know. I have it on, on, yeah. on that the That was the idea, actually. Yeah, yeah. And, I, and I really appreciate uh, I actually wanted to comment that the first time that I saw a talk by you, you were talking about the first thing you opened was the singular value decomposition in the 2019 summer school. You were super excited about it and I couldn't understand why that was important. But you seem very excited about this one and I and I trust that I'm going to read it and I'm going to be like, wow. More than once right. years and Paolo, you will get super excited about it. Yes, <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Like, oh, more than once right. So but, but the comment that I want to make is that I at least resonate a lot with the idea of creating this library yeah. and it's part of the thing that I was talking about that there, I, there has to be a way where we can help the community as a whole to very quickly adopt this method. Sure. Uh, so I, I count me as an interesting, yeah. interested partner to work on that. Now, I'm actually thinking more back to what uh, Manu Sher said in, a, in the morning, right? Because you have this huge uh, initiatives on, let's say, large language yeah. models. And the question is, how can we interface with that? And I want to expose to you, to one of our buyers of mine, uh, perhaps not a bias, but it's a kind of feeling I have or an intuition is that we as physicists, I think we can use these uh, methods to actually extract meaningful information about physical systems. When you train a large language model, it's much more difficult to actually extract from the parameters you end up in a fit what they actually mean. But we can actually dig a little bit deeper and try to compare, let's say, a uh, like the wave functions which uh, Jane and Alessandro will talk about tomorrow and compare them with traditional many body methods and then look at, let's say, the overlap, and perhaps that can teach us about the correlations which we are looking after. What kind of uh, elements of, let's say, of nuclear force play a fundamental role in these differences? If you think that the results you have are better than those you have with another many body method, because then you can be led to believe that I have a better answer, and what does my answer mean? So I think from a, from a physicist's point of view, for us, it's a little bit easier to actually extract meaningful information from the training of a neural network. And that's where, uh, that's why I think it's so interesting to actually link up with these huge developments which are taking place. Yeah. It, it seems to me, especially with all the messaging coming from the DOE, that one of the, if there is to be a potential future for three months, then making our methods and such open and preferably useful uh it, it seems like it's in our best interest right? mm -hmm. so perhaps we should have a little informal pact with one another that we try to publish as openly as possible yeah that's good yeah. well i'm not sure uh, actually why sure. because under a streamline mm -hmm. we are supposed to produce New exciting physics. This is not a cyber 
I would say, special. You are not, this is not like BAM, right? In BAM, our goal is to generate software. Yeah. You are going to produce amazing science yes. using those tools. But we're using those tools and we're publishing openly the code that uses those tools for physics so that other people can physics can use. Yeah. The question is whether DOE in nuclear physics would be excited about the tools. Ask her, would be. We're not talking, yeah, I'm not talking about the tools necessarily. Okay. Other, other questions for Martin? Right. Now, let's thank more. Again. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so what's going to happen now is we're going to walk just around the corner and take a picture. That shouldn't take so long. Um, and then we'll come back here and have a, a discussion. And then we will go to the pizza house at 6 p.m. for, for dinner. Okay.